getting into the Word of God, such an exciting thing to get into the study of God's Word because God speaks to us as we make ourselves available to Him. And as we begin Nehemiah chapter 1, we're going to be looking tonight at the call to ministry. Let's pray. Father, we know that Your Word is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And we pray tonight you would pierce our hearts, Lord, that you would convict us, that you would exhort us, that you would encourage us, and that you would commission us for the work that you have for each one of us. We commit this time into your hands now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, as we studied in the book of Ezra, for those of you that were here, the southern kingdom of Judah had been completely destroyed and the people were taken captive into Babylon and there they were going to be for 70 years. And that time had transpired, and then God's people were enabled to come back from their captivity. While they were in their captivity, however, the Babylonian Empire was taken over and destroyed by the Medo-Persian Empire, and it was through King Darius the Mede that the children of Israel were allowed to come back into their homeland. And we saw two waves of return of the captivity. One first took place in the beginning of the book of Ezra under Zerubbabel. The second took place under Ezra himself as he came back to reestablish the worship of God, to rebuild the temple, to rebuild the altar, to reestablish the worship of God in the place where God had set his name. And under Nehemiah, the Persian king, Artaxerxes, would now permit a third wave of captives to return to Jerusalem. And Nehemiah was going to come with a different purpose. Ezra, of course, was a scribe and a priest, and he was instrumental in bringing revival to God's people through the Word of God, through the teaching of the Word of God. And here we're going to see him again in the book of Nehemiah. Ezra was, of course, a man of the Word. But Nehemiah is much different. He was a Jewish businessman. He was actually a butler to Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, who was the stepson of Esther, the queen, who was queen to King Ahasuerus. And the events taking place in the book of Esther took place between Ezra and Nehemiah. And we're seeing here as we pick up after those events that Nehemiah was going to sense the call of God to go into full-time ministry. He was working in a secular environment, but God had touched his heart and God had a purpose for him to call him out of that to give up all the benefits of his secular job, his position, his influence, his power, his comforts, to leave all of that ultimately to serve God. But he had been preparing for it because he was a man of God. Nehemiah knew the word of God. He knew the promises of God. He knew the covenant that God had made with his people. And he knew the power of God. Yet he was born in captivity. He was there living in Babylon living in this region of Shushan, living in the region of Persia, never having actually been in the city of Jerusalem before, but there he was, a trusted advisor to the king. He tended to the needs of the king. He was a close confidant to him, and he had the oversight of the affairs of the kingdom as a cupbearer. He had direct access to the king, and God was preparing him for the work that he wanted to have done. And God oftentimes uses us in the experiences of our own life for ministry. Maybe you're doing some kind of work in the world. Maybe you're a businessman. Maybe you're a construction worker. Maybe you work at a convenience store. Maybe you do a different kind of work that you might think, how could God use me here? What could I possibly do for the kingdom of God where I'm at? Whatever your background, God can use it. The name Nehemiah means comfort of God which is interesting because that is the very name that is given to the person of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, the paracletus, the comforter, the one who comes alongside to help. And that's exactly what Nehemiah was going to be to God's people. God was going to send him to complete the work of revival that he had begun through the first return of the captives who came back in the book of Ezra. In Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1 begins... The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, it came to pass in the month Chislev, in the 20th year, as I was at Shushan, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach.'" 
The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. So here we have the beginning of Nehemiah's call to the ministry. Whenever God calls a man into the ministry, he works on both sides. He prepares the minister and he also prepares the ministry. And so here we find the first stage of Nehemiah's call to the ministry, which was an awareness of the need. Nehemiah recognized that the walls of the city of Jerusalem were in disrepair, completely destroyed. The gates were burned with fire. And the Lord met Nehemiah right where he was, working at his job, doing his business, and made him aware of the need. And Nehemiah also made himself available. He was not only willing to go, but he was also willing to listen and to find out what the needs were. And it's important that we're sensitive to the needs of others. If you only care about yourself, if you're only concerned about what's going on in your own life, God will never use you. God wants us to be concerned. God wants us to be invested in the needs of others. And Nehemiah was a servant. But more importantly, Nehemiah had a servant's heart. Verse 4 says, So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Here we find the second stage to Nehemiah's call to the ministry. He had a burden for the need. Nehemiah recognized what was going on and it broke his heart. It gave him a burden. It gave him a strong desire. We can't be effective in any ministry unless we have a burden in our heart. God, why aren't you using me? God, why don't you give me the opportunity to share my faith? God, why don't you give me that open door to be able to do that work that I know that I want to do? Do I have a burden? Do I have a, an intense longing and a desire for people to be saved, for lives to be changed, for the lost or the weary or the suffering people? It was John Knox, who was the founder of the Presbyterian Church of Scotland in the 1500s, who exclaimed, give me Scotland or I die. That was his desire above everything else. That was his heart. God, I want to die unless you give me what I'm longing for. What is it that you will be willing to die for? What has God put on your heart that is that ministry that is so burdensome to you that you can't help but see God do that through your life? Many of us will be willing to die for our wives or our children, but what about a total stranger? There has to be a burden for the lost. There has to be a burden for the needs of those who are suffering, of those who are in need. And Nehemiah says, I sat down and wept and mourned many days. He took time to stop what he was doing. He was moved. God had put that burden on his heart and he wept. He mourned. He was grieving. He was grieving over the destruction of what he saw. His heart was broken for what he saw, was revealed to him. And the next stage to Nehemiah's call to the ministry was this, that he prayed. He fasted and he prayed. Devastated by the condition of God's people in Jerusalem, his heart went out to them. He didn't just jump into action. He paused, he considered, he pondered what was going on, and the action that he took was that he prepared himself through fasting and praying. If you're going to do any work, any ministry for the Lord, you will need to learn from the example that we see here of Nehemiah. And this is so backwards from the way of the world. The world is filled with men of action. If you see a problem, jump into it. Just do it. Do something. Take matters into your own hands. Get it done. And that's kind of the tendency of the world. But for a man of God to say, you know what, I need to pray about this. I need to pause. I need to think about what does God want to do? What does God want to do in my life and through my life and through my circumstances so that I can be effective for him in accomplishing his purposes? Because oftentimes I can look at a situation and think, yeah, sure, here I know exactly what needs to be done. It's so clear. It's so obvious. But that may not be what God wants to do. Pray. Ask God to show you, and he will. God may be calling you into some ministry. Pray. Don't just jump into it. No matter how right it may seem, pray. Notice Nehemiah's prayer, verse 5. And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. If you want to know how to pray, Study the prayers of the Bible. Learn from those men of God who prayed and had a relationship with God. Notice how Nehemiah starts his prayer. God of heaven. He had the right perspective. Once you get your perspective right with who you're praying to, 
It's amazing how immediately your problems, your situation, all the things that you're dealing with, all the struggles you're facing can become so small and insignificant. The more that we're in alignment with who God is and what our problems are, it's pretty hard for us to start complaining right away. It's pretty hard to start blaming others or even blaming God when we put ourselves in light of who God is and we recognize his power, his majesty, his awesomeness. It's hard to go through difficulty and to blame God when we realize who God is and what God wants to do through that. And now notice the natural response we have in the right perspective in our prayer. It reveals just how sinful we are next to the greatness of God. When we realize who God is, we realize how sinful we are and how powerful God is and how able God is. Nehemiah said, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now day and night for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. God, we failed. God, I failed. Notice the ownership that Nehemiah takes here. This is a characteristic of a great leader. Take ownership. We're so quick to deflect, to blame the other person. This all started in the book of Genesis, in the Garden of Eden. Adam, where are you? You ate of the tree of the knowledge of the woman you gave me. She's the one. <laughs> so quick to blame. We have a tendency to want to find fault with somebody else and deflect that. Take ownership. Don't just point the blame on others or on God. You might say, well, I am the way that I am because look at my past. My father was an alcoholic. I got caught up in the wrong crowd. It's just my natural disposition. It's my Irish temper, if you're Irish. We can easily blame it on our circumstances. I'm just a product of my environment. That's, I'm, just, I'm never going to change. And we fail to take accountability for who we are. The truth is, if we don't take ownership of our, sh our sin, God won't hear our prayers. God said to the prophet Isaiah, in chapter 59, verse 1, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor is his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you. Why? So that he will not hear. He will not hear. If you want God to hear you, if I want God to hear me, I have to follow this example of Nehemiah. I have to recognize the sin in my own heart. Sin always breaks fellowship with God. That is always first and foremost. Deal with that. Take responsibility. Men, this goes for us personally as well as our own lives, our families, our marriages, our children. The problem that Nehemiah realized was that the walls of Jerusalem were broken down and the gates were burned with fire. What do walls do? Well, number one, walls prevent the enemy from coming in. Walls were intended to be protection. But not only that, walls actually kept people on the inside where they needed to be. So they wouldn't go wandering astray out into the world, dabbling with all of the enemies in the land, all the people that were trying to draw them out, to draw them away from the work that God wanted to do in the midst of where they were. We need walls to keep us from the enemy coming in as well as to keep us from going out to the enemy. We need to build walls around our own lives. We need to build walls around our marriages. We need to build walls around our families to keep ourselves protected from the outside influence and also to keep us from going out into the world. And as we look at our nation, we see the problems with broken walls. Our borders are broken literally. Our society has walls that have been infiltrated. They're broken down. The enemy has come in and has broken them, destroyed our gates with fire. And we see what the enemy and the damage that the enemy is doing. But what about the walls of our own lives? Have we neglected the walls in our own marriage? Have we been unfaithful to the Lord? Have we been neglecting praying with our wives? Have we neglected washing them with the water of the word or serving the Lord with our wives together? And the same goes with our children. You know, if they wander off into the world, is it because we've neglected the walls around them? Yes, it's true that some of our kids are gonna climb out a window and they're gonna get a rope and they're gonna climb down without anybody noticing. 
But are we making it easy for them? Are we making it accessible for them? Nehemiah took responsibility. Verse 8, he says, Remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations, but if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you are cast out to the farthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I has, have chosen as my dwelling for my name. Notice how Nehemiah reminds God of his promises. This is a good model for us to practice. Pray God's word. People often say, oh, I don't know how to pray. Pray the word of God. Learn the word of God. Meditate on the word of God and then pray it. Pray it out. Remind God. It reminds me of the promises of God as I'm praying. And it encourages me. And it gets my heart in alignment with God. It's good to remind God of his promises because it does just that. It aligns me with the purposes that God has and not my own purposes. And prayer is more than just asking for my needs. It is that, but it's more than that. God knows what I need, but prayer is for me to accomplish God's purposes. He'll take care of my own needs. I just need to align my heart with God's heart and begin to pray on behalf of what he wants to do. When I begin to do that, then that gives him the opportunity not only to do the work he wants to do through me, but then the work that he wants to do in the needs that I have. If God's people had just fulfilled their purpose that God had for them, he would have protected them, he would have provided for them, he would have taken care of them, he would have been their God and they would have been his people and everything would have gone well for them. But they chose to rebel. They failed to be his representatives to the world and God knew their hearts so he told them ahead of time what would happen. If they forsook him, he would forsake them. They would be scattered by their enemies and that is exactly what happened. Over and over and over, if you study the Old Testament, you see the history of the nation of Israel. God allowed the enemies to come in and to destroy them, to carry them away into exile, taking them away from their homeland. But God always extends his mercy. He makes his mercy available. He allowed his people to return. If they would return to him they could return back to their homeland. God would restore them. He would bring them back to the place of worship. He would restore them back to fellowship. And that is what God wants to do for every one of us here tonight. God wants to bring us out of our place of captivity, out of the place where we have been scattered because we have turned from him, we've forsaken him. God wants to bring us back and restore us. It's the devil who wants to condemn us and make us feel like you're not worthy. You shouldn't even code to Bible study. You shouldn't even read your Bible. You shouldn't pray with other people, you hypocrite. That's what the devil wants to do. God simply says, if you return to me, then I will return to you and I will restore you. He warns us of the consequences, but he also promises that restoration is there if we will just turn back to him. Verse 10, now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. I like this. Nehemiah reminds God of his promise, not only of his promise, but of his possession. Your people, these are your people. These are the people that you have redeemed. We are God's people. We belong to him. God has bought us. God has paid for us. We are his possession. God isn't telling us that we no longer belong to him because he's chastening us. We still belong to God. And Nehemiah isn't blaming God for the mess that the people were in. He was simply reminding God that they were his people. He was the one who redeemed them by his power, by his might. And you remember in the Old Testament the story of the Exodus where God delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt, brought them out of the bondage, and God had commanded the people to remember and to celebrate the Passover perpetually and that the story of the exodus out of Egypt was to be passed on from generation to generation. And it was the greatest story of redemption seen in the Old Testament that the children of Israel had experienced. God delivered his people from 400 years of bondage through his servant Moses. He divided the Red Sea and brought his people through on the dry land without anyone being touched by the devastation of that sea. And the most memorable miracle in the history of the children of Israel, God said, remember this. Remember what I did to save my people. When it looks like maybe God has forsaken his people, God hasn't. 
If they turn from him and forsake him, he will turn away from them. But if they turn back, he says, I'm right here. I'm right here to receive you. And yet even Moses had to remind God that they were his people when they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, complaining, murmuring, rebelling against God. At one point when Moses had gone up to Mount Sinai, the people wondered, where is this Moses? We don't know what's happened to him. So they said, hey, Aaron, come on, help us out here. And you remember the story. They ended up making this golden calf, and they bowed down, and they worshiped it. The people grew weary of waiting and pressured Aaron, his brother, to do something. They had lost their conscious awareness of God's presence through Moses in their midst. And it was at that point that God said, Moses, step aside. I'm going to destroy them. You know, it can be very easy, especially in ministry, to get frustrated with God's people. I heard a story of a pastor who was talking to another pastor. He said, you know, I love the ministry. It's just the people I can't stand. (laughs) It doesn't work that way. God was frustrated with his people back in Exodus. Exodus chapter 32. You can turn there if you want. We'll read a few verses there. In verse 7 of Exodus chapter 32, after Moses had that conversation with the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, get, go and get down. For your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have even seen this people, and indeed it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them and I will make you of you a great nation. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with a great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak and say he brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Remember Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of I give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. So here's this confrontation. God's saying, Moses, step aside while I consume your people. (laughs) The people you brought out of Egypt, Moses says, no, no, no. These are your people. You delivered them. You saved them. You redeemed them. They belong to you. Moses reminded the Lord of the covenant that he had made with his people. In reality, God wasn't going to consume them. What was God doing? God was moving Moses to intercede on behalf of his people. Sometimes God reveals things to us so that we will be moved to intercede, to pray, to be aware of the situation, to be aware of what's going on in the world around us so that we can pray, so that our hearts can be broken, so that we can have a heart after God. And God gave Nehemiah the same desire. God touched Nehemiah's heart to intercede on behalf of the people. And God is looking for a man who will stand in the gap to pray. Who will pray? Who will go before us? God asked. God knew that Nehemiah was a man of prayer. He said, God, you are the owner of these people. These are your people. Only you can revive them. Only you can restore them. Only you can rebuild them and reestablish them. He says in verse 11, O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name, and let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. Now that Nehemiah had called upon the God of heaven, he had acknowledged his and the people's sins. He reminded God of his covenant with his people. Now he moves into his petition. He says, may you grant me mercy before the king. Nehemiah recognized here that it was a mere mortal that God could use to accomplish his purposes. He recognized that he was here for a greater purpose than his own benefit. Hey, this is great being in the king's palace. I get great food. I get great perks. The benefits are incredible. It's important that we recognize God's sovereignty over the affairs of humanity, over the affairs of our circumstances. 
those who are willing to use their natural positions, their influences, their resources, their opportunities for God's purposes, those are the ones that God will use. We see this so clearly in the book of Esther. When we read in the book of Esther how that the wicked Haman had sought to destroy all of the Jews from the kingdom, it was Mordecai, Esther's uncle, who pleaded with her to go in before the king to make petition to the king. And of course, she knew the law of the land, that if anybody went into the inner court of the king without permission, unless the king raised up his scepter, that person would be put to death. And she was fearful. She said, I haven't been called in. I haven't been asked to go. But what was Mordecai's response? He said this, who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Who knows that you are here for this very purpose, not for yourself, not maybe for your whole family or what you might perceive as being God's blessing upon your life, but God has you here for a strategic purpose. He was saying, Esther, you don't know, but the only reason that you are here is that God has placed you for this one opportunity right here and for you to recognize it and to act upon it. And Esther ultimately ended up going into the king's court and God did answer and God did work and everything worked out according to the way that God wanted to do it. But how many times do we say, Lord, here I am, send someone else. <laughs> Don't send me to do that. Sure, I'll pray for somebody else. Don't send me. And we have all kinds of reasons why we can't go, why we can't do that thing that God perhaps is making aware to us of what it is that he's wanting us to do. We have all kinds of reasons. Nehemiah knew what he had to do and he recognized that God would use him and that he needed the favor of the king to do what God had called him to do. He looked at the natural circumstances and he realized that God wanted to work in the midst of that. It wasn't that Nehemiah was trusting in man to do God's work, but he was trusting in God to move in man's heart. And this is where we see the supernatural working within the natural. Oftentimes we, we fail to recognize that. We're looking for a supernatural that is so obvious that clearly that's God. But we fail to oftentimes recognize the supernatural within the natural. How is God working in my circumstances? How is God using my life and the things that are around me? God often works in both at the same time and it's up to us to work with God in both of those. How do we do that? Pray. Wait on the Lord, seek the Lord, ask God to show us. Pray that God would give you open doors in the midst of your circumstances. Pray that God would give you favor with man when you're stepping out to do something for the Lord. Maybe you're going before a judge. God, give me favor in this situation. God, we're going to go into this nation. We're going to do this work for you. We need your protection. We know that we're not allowed to go here. God, shield us from those that would try to stop us and to prevent us from doing your work. Sure, God can do it on his own, but he chooses to use us. He chooses to use supernatural within the natural. And he longs for us to be part of that and to see how he does that. He is glorified when we recognize that supernatural work that takes place in such a natural way, and that is when we walk by faith, not by sight, looking at how God is moving in our midst. May God help us to answer the call to the ministry, just like Nehemiah was about to do right here stepping out to do something, as we'll find over the next several weeks as we go through and we see what Nehemiah's task was. It would be a time of revival, a time of rebuilding broken walls, reestablishing God's people, and he would respond to that call to ministry. May God help us all to be aware of the needs, to have the burden, and to respond, to begin by praying, and to know that God will work in the midst of our circumstances, that God will use us, God wants to use us, but he's just looking for us to be ready, to be available, and to be obedient. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the truths that you've given to us. Lord, it was Paul who said these things were written for our learning, those things that were written afore so that we can understand who you are and how you work and how you want to work and move and establish your purposes through us here today. Lord, we pray that you would establish us in these things tonight, Lord, that we would have a heart for those things that you have a heart for, that we would see the needs of the world around us, that we would recognize the walls that are broken in our own lives, in our marriages, our families, our nation, wherever you might send us, Lord, 
Help us to be ready. Help us to be willing. Help us to be men of prayer. Men who are waiting upon you. Men who know what it is to be still and know that you are God and to cry out to you, to be broken, to be humble before you, to wait upon you. Lord, break our hearts. Lord, call us to the work that you have for us. We thank you for your word. We thank you that it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Show us the way that we should go. We thank you for what you are going to do. And we commit it all into your hands now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week.